Hello, listeners, and welcome to season two, episode four of the non-existent story. Uh, today, Casey will be reading two dramatic readings, uh, one from, as you know, a real and when I say real, I mean published author, and the other from the strange inner workings of her own mind. Casey, what have you brought us today? So the, uh, the theme for today um, uh, is parties, great grand parties. Uh, because I'm in the process of planning a wedding, and so I've been thinking about the party as a, as a, as an event and as a as a philosophical concept, so to speak. Great Gatsby, so. Fitzgerald, I win. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that it, that was, of course, the starting point. And we could talk after. You could think of a, of lists of great literary parties, and oh. um, you can look them up. In fact, that I have, and uh, the one I've chosen that's already published does not come from any of those on the list. Okay. All right. So good. There's your, there's your first hint and your last. All right. All right. So I will begin. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to the Marcel Mouse Portrait Gallery, designed by George Albert Battle and completed in 1957. On our tour today, we will hear from artists, architects, curators, and historians about the history of this remarkable building. You should now be on the top floor, just below the domed skylight. Look out over the central void of the atrium. A quarter mile of concrete ramps spiral around the perimeter of the atrium, descending at an angle of three degrees. The ramps create a continuous floor space from the rotunda to the terrazzo floor, 96 feet below you. Mouse asked Battle to design the museum as a gallery for the large collection of portraits that had fallen into his possession in the wake of the Second World War. Art historian Sylvia Lowry explains, well, you see, at that time, in the late 40s, many museums in Europe were remodeling and desperately in need of money. They had accumulated all these portraits that they had no place to store and with no interest to the public. So they figured, great, we'll pawn them off on the Americans. And so the Mouse family was able to purchase in, in bulk, as it were, nearly 130,000 portraits of shop of shipbrokers, courtiers, society beauties, zoologists, sultans, maharajas, Jesuit missionaries, and thousands, literally quite quite literally thousands of European aristocrats. Though naturally, after that infamous party on opening night, there are now not quite so many. Battle's grandson, Henry Battle, an apprentice during the time of the museum's construction, recalls the party. The night, <clears throat> the night before we opened to the public, Marcel had decided to throw this lavish banquet. The guests were all seated at a single table, quarter mile long, that ran the whole length of the ramp and followed its natural curve down to the center of the spiral, ending in one small circular table. Marcel sat at one end of the little table and my grandfather on the other. No one has ever understood how it happened or why. But at one point, I looked out over the railing and saw that down on the floor, Marcel had stood up from the table and was now stabbing away with his steak knife at a portrait of the fifth Marcus of Bath, while my grandfather rammed his cane through the freshly plastered walls. Then Marcel, steak knife still in hand, began to ascend the ramp, slashing away at the paintings on the walls behind the guests, while my grandfather strode about, wrenching the knobs off the water fountains, chipping the marble, scratching the wood. The guests at the table were, of course, quite upset, but no one did anything to intervene, and I couldn't tell you why we didn't try to stop them. Maybe because everything they were breaking was theirs to destroy, or maybe because the frenzy of destruction was simply so so fascinating in a primitive sort of way. And it wasn't until Marcel had destroyed a 16th century portrait of the bearded Dutch woman, his most valuable acquisition, that my grandfather finally stopped trying to shatter the glass skylights he had designed and whose installment he had supervised so carefully the week before. End. This is great. It's an excerpt within an excerpt within an excerpt. I it's, like it. it's it's a it's a Russian doll of of delights. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I love what was accomplished here, literally, and I'm um, I'm very pleased to see you uh, break out the accents. I hope there will be more of that in episode two. <laughs> I demand more. Uh, 
German now. I mean, we can be <laughs> German, German after. German. <laughs> well, that, that could work, actually. Although I, I won't try it. I, you, I'll leave that one to you. Okay. okay. Are you ready for my... Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Ever since that night when the truth was revealed to me, my profound teleological faith had transformed into a religion of chaos, of which I now considered myself, along with the power of my riches and the prestige of my house, something of a high priest to administer chance, to introduce it, impose it, implant it, to spread like a missionary the respect and the devotion that it deserved was my vocation and my destiny. It was then that I decided to organize my first really chaotic party. To begin with, the footmen were not to lead the guests straight to the, to the grand foyer, but rather to random locations all over my estate, each guest to be dropped off in a different place, in the lamp room, the kitchen, a maid's bedroom up in the attic, the chapel, the hen house. There they were to be left to handle the situation as best they could. For those who, in spite of everything, managed to reach the grand foyer, where neither myself nor anyone in my family would be waiting to greet them, the orchestra was to play dance numbers that began normally, only to gradually become slower and slower, until it was no longer possible to dance at all. Delicious-looking appetizers, passed round by servants on the traditional silver platters, would turn out to be, but not always, for then it would not have produced the same effect, worm sandwiches, sawdust meatballs, petty fours of serpent flesh. And all the while, in every room, a great multitude of construction workers were to labor without ceasing, repairing the doors, the ceilings, the walls, and the furniture, and never once acknowledging the presence of the creme de la creme of our society. That particular party was a great hit. Once the initial moment of confusion had passed, the guests set out to explore the chaos with renewed energy and, with the exception of the old people and the hypocrites who left immediately, everyone enjoyed themselves so much that it was daylight by the time I could finally chase them away with hoses and watering cans, for they refused to go home. I was unsatisfied. It seemed to me that I'd only managed to throw a particularly exciting party, nothing more. Nothing that could really be compared with true chaos. I had to refine my methods, apply my genius on a much greater scale. Above all, I had to convert the unbelievers. It was not acceptable that the guests simply go home to continue their orderly, everyday existence. As soon as I landed upon a method, the rest was easy. My method consisted in neither more nor less than organizing a rather confusing imitation of life. If the only reality of life was chance, that is to say, insignificance, confusion, the constant dissolution of forms into nothing to give rise to new forms, likewise destined to dissolution, I need not rack my brain devising ingenious little fictions. I had only to offer my guests a passable representation of the world that surrounds us, with just a bit more disorder than usual, for them all to be submerged into true chaos. End. <laughs> it's like I feel like there needs to be an evil laugh there. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't I don't know if I would really want to be invited to this party or if it would be one of the worst experiences of my life if I were. But either way, <laughs> one of them will be my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Choose wisely. Choose wisely. <laughs> Dress accordingly. <laughs> no more than one plus one. <laughs> plus one. <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love... All right, so I, I will first say that I really love the theme that you chose. And um, for our listeners who don't know, although I can't imagine that there are any... Um, who aren't related to us, but if in case there ever were, <laughs> you are planning a wedding. And so I can see why this would be on your mind. Um, so the two stories that you brought, uh, just want to make sure that I fully grasp what happened in both, uh, to my understanding. Uh, in the first story, you have a narrator, which is essentially the the kind of intercom voice that you would get on a tour. Right. So I'm, they're, they're, they're touring some, some old building, and there's one of those kind of emotionless, informative voices over the intercom telling you about the building. And 
it's actually really focusing instead of the building it, it starts to focus on a moment in that building's history which was a, a certain party and then it has other voices come on who were either at that party or who had relatives who were there because it happened some time ago uh, sort of describing the events which took place uh, those being that the the people hosting the party the the owners of all of this uh, art within this gallery started destroying their own art and the guests didn't really know what how to react to it which was kind of funny um it's my party and i'll cry <laughs> if i want <laughs> That was actually the song that I was going to have you know, in the background, but copyright, awkward. I, uh, it's a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I did, I really enjoyed that. I, I, I like the whole play up of that excerpt. And then in excerpt two, the narrator is uh, this eccentric, wealthy person um, who who narrates in such a way that you, you can never be sure how good of a a grasp of reality he has, you know. So, so that kind of factors in, but he's trying to to plan lavish, not, I shouldn't say lavish parties, but parties that are bizarre in a way that attempt to convert those he has attend into his way of thinking or push them into a sense of what he considers to be true chaos and this to him would be a glorious thing. Um, and I, I really like that too. Although it made me think of Clue, so <laughs> really, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's the the film Clue, and he's I will invite oh. all of these people into the house, but it's like a mystery, and then there will be a murder, and it will be fabulous to see what they do, and I mean putting them into awkward situations on purpose. So really, more of like a twisted psychology experiment than any kind of party one might want to end up being invited to, where the food is actually worm sandwiches in disguise, like that scene from Indiana Jones. I also thought of that He's actually in India. at one point. Yeah. Um, yes, that's a very uh, you you've really grasped I think the essence of of both of them very well, which is very gratifying to me. Um, yeah. So the um, the the first one the the idea of 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 the ability of the hosts to stage they use the party as a kind of staging for this this spectacle of destruction that everyone else then has to kind of try to figure out. Mm -hmm. what the sense of because they don't seem to be necessarily irrational or crazy people on, on the contrary they seem to be quite quite sane and uh and productive members of society so it, why this um this frenzied outbreak is uh, but if, the question if there are art lovers though can you really be sure because what if <laughs> their destruction of art is actually the creation of new art it's it's hard. What is that one photo I saw recently? Uh, somebody randomly put a pair of glasses on the floor of an art gallery and then waited, and people started gathering around, staring at the glasses on the floor like they were appreciating it. So, I mean, maybe they were just taking it to that level. I mean, the museum is an interesting space and um, kind of an additional factor because the a museum over... I don't know if it overdetermines, but it determines the meaning of objects so much more than any other space kind of does. Uh, so it becomes this, instead of just being a utilitarian object, once you put any object in the museum, and this is like the gift of of the avant-garde and like Marcel Duchamp in particular, who basically famously installed like a urinal and submitted it as a as his uh a mass produced urinal as his entry in this competition. And there was this huge scandal and then the art world has never been the same since. Uh, because, you know, he said that you could be treated, it, he, he tilted it and he signed it basically. And then he said you could treat it as art. So like that whole idea has been like revisited because it was very, very powerful. So yeah, I mean, there's this sense, especially of modern art um, having to do with like the destruction of tradition and things like that. So there's a lot of different ways that you can look at it from an artistic, uh, point of view, I suppose. Um, but then the second one, yes, where the, the narrator, as you said, it seems to be the, the party is not a pretext for a spectacle, but rather a chance for him to play God. And so it's a, he gets his own little world and then he can just kind of screw with people however he right. wants to. So what, it's what was, kind of different notions of parties and how they're supposed to work. What was the, the phrase that he used in the beginning? A teleological fate? Faith, my profound teleological faith. Tele teleological. Yes. What is 
for for our right our readers who don't know what that means <laughs> actually, i actually had to look that one up too uh, teleological um it means um towards an end so it's about causes so he mm. he's um he, when he says my profound teleological faith, he's probably referring to the fact that he thinks everything has a, a reason and a cause, that the world is governed by some sort of cause and effect. But he's having some sort of crisis, and so the, the ultimate cause of everything has to now be chaos, which is also the ultimate effect. So this is like his part of his, his crisis and his understanding of the meaning of life, basically. And so he's converted to the religion of chaos, and now he must convert everyone else and so it's it's still like very religious in its tone but it's the religion mm -hmm. of chaos it's kind of a paradox I like it. yeah yes yes i like that a lot <laughs> but so i pictured him as as the butler from clue but <laughs> but with like if you it was like an inverted butler uniform and if you if you reversed it it would have like a big red silk cape and like a high priest cone atop his head and and he would he would be the master and high priest of all things of chaos. So that was that was the the image that I had. Uh, he is it, he is a, a gothic kind of narrator. You you would mm -hmm. picture him in a gothic scene, whereas mm -hmm. in the first the the setting is um is much more. Uh, well, you have a you know a sense of how the architecture works out in the first one, so um, so that you can get this what kind of space would be appropriate for the kind of spectacle that's being played out. Um, yes, and and because the 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 initial voice is is machinery is is an electronic voice, it it has that kind of distancing that you get with technology from from things that are more tied into to emotion and humanity. So it's interesting. Um, but I I did like how they were very different tones in both stories, but they played off of each other really well. So. Ah, good. I'm glad. It, it should have had a German accent though. In the second one. Oh, for the second one? I mean, how would you? Uh, how would? But how do you pronounce teleological faith with a German? Uh, teleo, tel, um, mm. I mean, the only thing I'd have to listen to a German accent ever since that's night nice when the truth. Yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> See, it's even better already. You have it started. <laughs> when the truth was revealed. <laughs> <laughs> it's pronounced I go. <laughs> Frederick. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and I think I'm going to guess which of these that you wrote. I think um, it should be easy. But well, you one, one can never know. One never knows in the non existent story. I, so, so many stories just. Until, until they do. So <laughs> I'm going to guess. Um, I'll, I'll give my reasoning afterwards in case I'm wrong. That you wrote the second story. I actually wrote the first one. Ah! Uh, so we need to start keeping track. I know that we're tied now for this season. For this season, we're we're one and one. But there there needs to be some sort of repercussions, I suppose. Uh, I think paying for marketing was discussed at one point. <laughs> Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I wrote the first one. I thought you might guess because it was, it was meant to be more adapted to, uh, to an audio file. Um, well, I, it did make me think of when you and I went on the, the Chicago tour of like the architecture tour and ah. it had the, our, our very interesting tour guide, um, talking about, you know, all of those lines everywhere. In the vertical, vertical lines. Ver vertical lines, Chicago windows, more yes. vertical lines. Yes. Upward. Gaze. Assless chaps upward. of gay pride. <laughs> <laughs> and then three really stone dudes in like a whiff of marijuana smoke on a bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> Why are but, we here? But, <laughs> but then I thought surely, surely if I were planning a wedding, I would be thinking about the gods of chaos and... <laughs> and incorporating them into my venue. So that's why I thought you might have written the second one. But I was wrong. Well, uh, so the the second one is um, a, it's not really a short story, it's not really a novella, it's like a long story. I guess that would be, mm -hmm. it's about, it's, about, it's from a, I think it's about 60 or 70 pages. Um, but it was, it's by an Argentine writer who originally wrote it in Italian because he lived in Italy for a long time. 
Um, mm -hmm. and then it was translated into Spanish, and then I translated this. Um, so okay. it's not well known, but it's, it's it's fantastic because you really I'm I'm really glad that the personality of the narrator comes across because that's the whole drama. He's a deformed Italian nobleman in like the 1500s, let's say. He's cross-eyed and hunchbacked, and he's missing a hand, and he has all these like deep like deformities. But the way he tells you about them, it's always like in like some dependent clause of a dependent clause of a dependent clause. <laughs> So he's always kind of dismissive about it, and he's a total snob, but his task is to discover the meaning of life. And so he has various kind of um, queries, and the first one is to, to get to know his fellow human beings, and so he goes out on a night of carnival in Italy, and they strip him naked, and they try to roast him alive, and so he's like, that method is not working. And then he, just, he dedicates himself to mystical contemplation. Uh, but he mostly just ends up masturbating, and then he falls off a cliff <laughs> one day. <laughs> <laughs> he gets like so he's like if the mysticism doesn't go very well basically he almost gets like eaten by birds or something while like caught in his wheelchair contemplating a sunset so he's like that's not working so he gets more and more bitter but he's still determined to find the meaning and so he gets this is the point where he decides that um life has no meaning and it's just chaos and so he has to prove that to himself with these various parties and they keep kind of getting more and more intense so it, it's kind of it was hard to take it out of context because you know the, it, there's an arc of his uh of his you know philosophical quest basically right it's um, it's evolving but uh, but still i'm glad that the personality came through because he is this sort of like really nerdy devious product of like a religious medieval nobleman culture and he's so absurd but he doesn't really recognize his own absurdity but he just becomes more and more devious as he gets more and more attacked and and eaten and <laughs> and fails in many other well i mean if you already have so many limited limiting disabilities and then the more you try to understand the hum humanity the the more limbs you seem to lose i could understand some bitterness developing yeah, yeah, but it's it's his outsider perspective kind of gives him some insights, but also separates him fundamentally from everyone else. So it's a really fascinating story, and I'm considering translating all of it just because I think people should have access to it because it's oh, great. But, I would read it. <laughs> I would definitely read it. It's it's really it's it's so funny. It's so funny because it's one of those things where the, it's all about the tone. So like he'll talk about like all these people that are like stripping him naked and like beating him with branches and uh, as I sat upon my beautiful upholstered velvet Spanish chair. So so he always throws in like these little adjectives that have nothing to do with what's going on. It creates a very nice effect. Um, but I assigned it to a class though, and it was way too hard. So <laughs> I, I do have to translate it. I think. But yeah, so that's that's chaos. Um, the First one, all right, so this took me a long time to, it was really hard for me to write a story this time. Mm -hmm. um, it was, yeah, it was just hard to have like inspiration, but I knew I wanted to do something about uh, weddings or parties or something like that. And I, um, I wanted to think, I, I liked the idea of thinking of the party like philosophically, like mm -hmm. what a party can show about, you know, humanity or, or anything else. And there's this great essay that I had read in grad school um, by Georges Bataille called the notion of expenditure. And in this, he has this idea of potlatch. And basically his theory is that most of economics is about accumulation and conservation and utility, right? But he's also pointing out that there, mankind seems to have this tendency towards like destruction and loss and sacrifice and things like that. that that's something that you see in every society and it's really important, but it's not really properly theorized. And so he's really interested in this book called The Gift by Marcel Mauss, uh, who describes a practice by actually Native Americans in your region, in the Pacific Northwest and into Alaska, who do mm -hmm. something called potlatch, which is in order to like assert their, uh, their supremacy, or there's various theories as to why they actually do it. Um, they would either you know kill all their slaves or give off these lavish gifts, and there's always little rivalries. So it, so it was like who could like torch more houses that belong to them? Who could destroy more of their own possessions in order to assert a sort of like primacy? 
Mm -hmm. So he was really interested in that notion of like lavish gifts and basically he calls it expenditure or loss or destruction, but um, that this is part of how every human society works or that it's integrated into it some way. That's his theory anyway. Uh, and so I was like, well, a wedding is kind of that because there's this enormous gift because especially if it's a large scale wedding, like it could be, <laughs> they're very expensive. So mm -hmm. basically you're, you're torching a lot of money for one day. So there's this kind of spectacular combustion and destruction of wealth. Yes. Involved in like a certain level of spectacle. So I wanted to do something with that, but I wasn't really having any ideas. Um, and I was just kind of looking through paintings. Have you, I don't know if you've seen a lot of paintings of feasts or banquets or parties or anything like that. Not really. I mean, what I, can, I mean, you have what? The, side, what, the, the last Passover. Um, the Last Supper. Yes, that one. And <laughs> <laughs> the most recent Passover. I, no, I, I'm, I'm, I gravitate towards the like the the medieval like violence, and so I yeah, mean, demons feasting on human flesh. I've seen a lot of those paintings from like older eras, but yes, not, that's about it. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of looking at those too. They, they used to be something that were portrayed more, but yeah, the the Last Supper is definitely one. There's um, there's a couple others, but the thing that I was noticing in these paintings is that they always have these really long tables. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is cool. I really like this. I like the idea of an, like an infinitely long table. And so I started writing this thing about a house that was kind of like a big Victorian rambling house and there was one table that was connected and it went into every room including like the bathroom and like down into the basement it was like one long table that like wandered through mm -hmm. but then there was no way in which you could see a spectacle of like destruction or expenditure because you need the big lavish spectacle of loss you need you need the straight view that takes in everything and yeah when you compartmentalize it it breaks it up so I was like, well, I need a space that would permit it. And then I was thinking, and uh, when I went to visit our brother, actually in New York, uh, we went to the Guggenheim Museum. And the Guggenheim Museum was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And the parts in the very beginning that describe the um, the space um, are a kind of modified but lifted from the audio guide to that museum. Because it's basically a big spiraling ramp. And I was like, it'd be so cool if there was one long table that went all the way down the ramp because it's just like an atrium and then the ramp kind of like goes up and up and up and up mm -hmm. and up. And the museum's basically one big connected space. So that was, so I set the table up there with the, the destruction kind of staged at the bottom. So it took me a while to get to that point, basically. But that was the, that was my journey. I, I like it. I like I like your journey. It's it's twisted and, and dark and convoluted, but in yes. but in a poetic way. It's deep, man. I dig it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and so basically the the idea is that the the, the artist the, the the art collector and the architect would engage in a sort of rivalry potlatch, but since that's totally far into Western sensibilities, no one would really know why they did it. But it could somehow and has actually because potlatch is really important for like contemporary theories of art as you kind of figured out like modern art permits these actings out it kind of justifies them in a way so a modern art museum would in a modern art museum that kind of thing would make make sense if that makes sense i mean it could be rationalized certainly um yeah which is by, kind of a shame artistic crowd no but i mean anything can because you could just say it's art it's kind of a blanket statement because anything can be yeah so that was the, that was the, I don't I don't think I'll actually do either because like most of them like you can just end up being really cruel to your guests so I was like I don't really think I would do this for a wedding, um, but uh, but yeah so anyway they, um, it was two they're two kind of like a philosophy of expenditure and loss that's kind of vaguely Marxist um, and vaguely erotic and then the second one which is like a guests as your like little lab rats and your great experiments. No, your, your great, great gothic ex gothic castle lab of experimentation. <laughs> Basically. Very, very Frederick Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Indeed. Indeed. I need to watch that movie again. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that was that was my journey. Um I think that I would call it like audio guide or something. I'm not really sure okay. what to call it. That would that uh, audio guide. Well, maybe. 
Because there's different more the types of the the style of narration than the the nature of the party. Well, if it were a longer piece, the idea would be to have this very very neutral flat voice, and then the quotes that they bring in because they bring in you know snippets of interviews and things like that. Um, and these kinds mm -hmm. of things would become like increasingly bizarre and outlandish and then wildly inappropriate to be listening to. <laughs> so I really liked that idea. <laughs> yeah, I would like that idea too. So that would work as a longer, a longer piece of writing. But I, I mean, that that's the thing with accents, which is which is fun to do on something like that, like a podcast like this, it's because you can play around with that, and it's a better medium than just writing where you've got to work on like written syntax, and it can be on or off. Or you would want multiple readers, which would be nice. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I mean, I am not, I, I don't have a a trained or a particularly pronounced talent and sort of voices, so you'd want to have you know a couple different people who could kind of sound like a you know. Uh, an 85 year old architect or a British curator or something like that. Yeah, maybe, maybe gallery tour. Gallery tour? That could be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then you get the. That there's, there's multiple kind of stories in there and you are in a gallery. Uh, but yeah, oh, and the, the author is uh, Rodolfo Wilcock. Wilcock. Um, Wilcock. Yeah, which is, sounds, it does not sound like an Argentine name. Um, Juan Rodolfo Wilcock has a very British last name. Hmm. Highly recommended. Although, well, he's kind of a minor figure. He was like a friend of Borges. He's like on the outer circle. I would read it if it were in English. Um, well, I, uh, thus is my limitation. I'll translate it because I, I can't find a translation in English. I would, read, I would read your translation. Okay. I'll work on it. It'll be fun. Yeah. It's, it's enjoyable. It's hard, but enjoyable. Um, but yes, so I, any, any other comments or... Um, no, I suggestions. <laughs> I think um, if you if you flush it out into a longer story and the the party became a component of it, then you could make it because the way that you describe this table that kind of winds ever upward. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't. I, I I was picturing like a gallery room with a long table in it. So I think. If you were if you were to flush it out in conjunction with other stories, and then you feel like more like you're walking through and you, and circling up, like in a shell, and then the stories kind of twist and turn and rise and evolve, like with that direction, it it, it could be actually a really cool. Yeah, that kind makes sense. It would need to reflect the fact that it's like a walking tour, and so like mm -hmm. now you're here now, and like I put spiral in a few times, but like it's really hard to describe a space that's like a complicated architectural space and have yeah. a story. So I kept cutting out stuff to try. To, I tried to keep it to a page. Uh, yeah. So no, but but I mean, if you had if you had additional stories kind of connecting to it, and you oh, associated like the next story, you, you keep turning up. Eventually, oh, it kind yeah. of clicks. But, I mean, that's just a way, or something that you could do if you were interested in in creating that effect. That's a good idea. Um, it's like a cool. short story collection that all follows the tour of one space. Mm -hmm. Ooh, and I then the actually... the narrator could link it if you wanted to. That would be fun. Oh, yeah, that would be fun. I like that idea. You're so good at this. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think we're probably uh, past the half hour mark. So, um, yeah, thanks for thank you for uh, for your insights and helping me kind of work through this because this is another one that I, I might like to develop down the road. Yeah, well, thank you for tricking me into choosing the wrong story, but that's fine. That's what we're all about here at the story dot com. Yes, like us, like us, follow <laughs> us, tweet us, and. Read us. That would be nice. <laughs> read, read, read us. But until next time, viewers, uh, namaste. Namaste. <laughs>